Welcome to the course Energy Resources, Economics and Sustainability. In the past few classes, we have been discussing the recent advances in the terms of technology that has helped us solve many of the problems that arise through the global energy change or the global energy increase. Those problems were basically the emissions of SO2, lead as well as ozone depletion. We tried to understand how because of technological advancement coming of the communities together, understanding the problem from its root causes, people were able to come up with nice uh, solutions and within a matter of decades, these problems could be solved to a great extent. In today's class, we are going to focus on a much more, uh, bigger problem, that's the global climate change or that of global warming, which I believe all of you would have heard about at some point in your life. The problem as such has become a big uh, sort of problem or a big uh, uh, issue that has been discussed a lot of popular medias. We, found, we find people discussing the global warming problem, the energy crisis, the climate change problem on different social media platforms, different talk shows and different kinds of newspapers and they uh, tend to give us all kinds of different opinions and many of these opinions tend to be coming not from a uh, very scientific point of view. So the aim of uh, today's lecture and the uh, coming few lectures would be give you a basic understanding what is the problem of global climate change? How is this problem very different from the problems that we have been uh, encountering in the past that was um, something related to sulfur oxides or acid rains, lead or ozone depletion? How are the dynamics very different? What is stopping? us from having or finding a good solution to climate change and what could be the possible ways of climate change mitigation. So these are some of the topics that we'll be discussing in the coming few classes. So if I talk about the problem of global climate change, this is also known by different uh, terms like global warming and uh, like uh, climate change, energy crisis. Uh, uh, commonly it is annotated by the term climate change because it gives us a feeling something is changing. Whereas if, when someone using the word uh, global warming, uh, people don't want to use that because it gives uh, the feeling that something is warming up. That's not a good feeling. Whereas change is something that is a part of a life since millennia and it's not something to be worried about. So people would want to give it a, a slightly neutral annotation and that is why climate change is a more often used term. But if you see the repercussions of this particular problem that we're talking about, it could be in our social lives or economics life, economical life and a political life. And there have been political discussions, there have been scientific discussions on this. Um, now, every uh, like uh, everything that we want to do, like what should be linked to sustainability, uh, companies need uh, want to focus on sustainability. The students, the projects they are doing want to focus on sustainability. Uh, the countries and the policies they are making want the sustainability aspect to win it. So it's a big issue. And some of it is politi politicized and some of it does have scientific backing to it. And what uh, in this class, we are going to understand these very facts. So uh, first, let us uh, 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 go ahead with the greenhouse gas effect or the greenhouse gases that have been the center of this more, um, major problem that we are talking about. So when we talk about uh, the greenhouse gas effect, this is basically uh, the increasing of the average temperature of the biosphere, which is uh, uh, the atmosphere which we are interacting in uh, on a daily basis. So if we go by the basic laws of thermodynamics, if we consider any system, any control volume, if it is receiving more energy, then it is able to emit the temperature or the energy is going to accumulate and its result will be the temperature of that particular system is going to rise. And this is something that happens with the planet Earth as well. We continuously receive insulation from sun in the form of the solar radiation and the Earth also emits a great deal of radiation to the outer space and that happens again 24-7. So during the day what happens is the insulation from the sun that we receive is much more the radiation than we are uh, or the planet earth is radiating uh, to the atmosphere outside and something opposite happens during the night time in which uh, the radiation from the sun uh, dips greatly whereas the radiation that is coming out from the earth to the atmosphere uh, tends to be uh, tends to be more and this is why you would experience that nights are generally cooler than the day times something similar also happens during the different seasons in the summers when we have longer days the insulation that is coming from the sun tends to be more than the radiation that the earth is emitting and that is one of the reason why uh, summer temperatures tends to be 
slightly higher than the average winter temperature. So this is a normal thermodynamic phenomena which all of us have been experiencing since many years. But apart from this energy exchange, there are also certain other uh, exchanges that happen. One particular exchange or, may, or some of the uh, exchanges that uh, uh, are experienced is the earth's core is at a much higher temperature than the surface of the earth. And this uh, heat is again is conducted from the interior to the surface of the earth and finally to the atmosphere. Then the earth also reflects a good fraction of the sun's radiation. And if you see different types of landscapes would have different radiation capacities. And the most uh, radiation capacity could be attributed to that of surfaces that are covered with ice. Ice covered surfaces have the capacity to reflect almost 90% of the insulation that they receive. Further clouds play their own role in blocking the insulation as well as reflecting the insulation that is coming from the sun. Clouds also tend to reflect some of the radiation that is coming from the earth. The oceans again have their vital role. They are huge water bodies. Majority of the earth is covered by the water bodies. They can absorb and release a good amount of heat. And they also play their role in regulating the temperature of the atmosphere. Further, we also have the terrestrial radiation uh, uh, get reflecting back to the earth by the clouds. And then there is one particular feature, the greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases have one particular feature that they are very selective to what kind of radiations they would want to absorb and what they would want to reflect. Normally, the GHGs are almost transparent to the insulation of the sun, which is coming from the sun, but they are very active in reflecting the radiation that is coming from the planet Earth. And that is what makes their role very interesting. They have been uh, like regulating the temperature on the Earth since, uh, the, uh, since the planet came into being. So some might, uh, someone might want to question, what if there were no GHGs in the atmosphere? Well, if there were no greenhouse gases, the, uh, the temperature of the earth has been predicted like it would be 33 degrees lesser than what the average temperature is now today. So if the average temperature that we are coming across around 20 degrees Celsius, if there were no GHGs present in the atmosphere, I'm talking about just zero GHGs, the temperature might be less than minus 10 degrees Celsius which means the life as it is present on earth might not be able to flourish or thrive as it has been doing since thousands of years. So GHG is like a protective layer that is uh, helping uh, build the temperature on the earth. It is building the temperature that is just optimum for the survival of the life on earth. But what happens when there is an increase in GHG, it also tends to have increased the reflection of the uh, radiation that is coming from the earth. When that happens, the temperature of the earth also begins to rise slowly. Now the temperature in itself might rise a few degrees Celsius, but the effect that it would have could be long term and could last uh, long term as well as the spatial variation could be huge. It could lead to great amount of weather disturbances in terms of extreme weather events like cyclones or hurricanes. It can also change the weather pattern in terms of uh, the growth season of certain crops. Uh, the areas which were very nice for cultivating crops might in future um, become uh, deserts and the opposite can also happen. It might also happen that deserts might be receiving snowfall. And these are the kinds of extreme weather events that uh, are led because of temperature change. Further, few other aspects of temperature change could be the increase in the sea level. Let us try to understand the same concept with the help of a simple diagram. So herein you can see the different types of radiations being coming, in, uh, being coming from the sun and being emitted from the earth. So as such, there is a nice thermodynamic equilibrium that has been existing for many years. But what has happened because of uh, or since the onset of the industrial revolution is that there has been an increased influx of the GHG gases primarily led by CO2 and this has led to a great amount of reflection of the radiation that is coming from the earth's surface which has uh, basically increased the temperature or led to an increase in the average temperature of the planet earth. Now, we understand that uh, the GHGs reflect a great deal of uh, energy back into the biosphere and it's like a blanket that has been warming the earth for millennia. And it's not that we can just do it with the GHGs, GHGs are vital for the existence of planet earth, 
but any change or even a small change in the concentration of GHGs in the in the atmosphere can have uh, great consequences that could lead to economic losses, that could lead to environmental losses, that could have political implications. Now, a major source of these GHGs is attributed to the increased amount of fossil fuels, which could be attributed to the coal, petroleum and natural gas. We understand that all the three major fossil fuels are composed of carbon and also some amount of energy is coming from hydrogen. The carbon items, whenever they are getting combusted, would form CO2. The basic equation we all understand would be the carbon combining with oxygen molecule forming the CO2 or the other pathway could be methane which is a major component in natural gas combining with two molecules of oxygen giving in CO2 plus two molecules of water. So these could be uh, some other ways of uh, producing but primary product that we see is the production of carbon dioxide and this is one of the major reasons why there has been an increase in the GHGs primarily led by CO2 and humans as such have been using these fossil fuels uh, since many years. Uh, first it used to be smaller but now with the uh, onset of industrial evolution as well as uh, uh, highly mechanized way of living where we would where the energy consumption has increased many fold we would consume energy for thermal engines we would consume energy for centralized heating we consume energy for the transportation we consume energy for the production of electricity which is primarily coming from the burning of fossil fuels and these fossil fuels uh, irrespective of which fossil fuel you are using called petroleum or natural gas would emit CO2 in the atmosphere. Some fossil fuel like natural gas would be a bit cleaner than coal but the end product uh, primarily remains CO2. And if you look at the CO2 emissions uh, for the different countries and the globe as such, we see they, it, they are nicely correlated with the increased in consumption of the fossil fuels uh, and the CO2 is directly correlated to that. We see the major industrialized nations of the world, the US, the European Union, China, UK, all have had uh, like an, a vast increase on CO2 emissions and this is primarily attributed to the increased use of fossil fuels in the past. We see like countries like US um, by far are one of the largest emitters of the world which have emitted more than 400 billion tons of CO2 since the 1970s. Of course these figures could be a bit different from the source that you are referring to but the magnitude uh, like uh, uh, would more or less or the comparison of the relative difference would more or less remain the same and we also see India here rising uh, the um, uh, rising in the emissions and it's uh, rising at a very fast rate. Further, we can see even the predictions of for the future is that like um, for the next 25 years or so, we, we are going to increase the CO2 levels. So, and these are very nicely correlated with the, with the onset of industrial evolution as well as the date from which we started using the three main fossil fuels for mass production of energy. And during the 1950s uh, to 2012, uh, 2015 or so, of course there was an increase in the fossil fuels that we have been using, but there have been also a significant increase in the Earth's population. The population also has been rising at a very fast rate in the last uh, 70 years or so. More the population, more are the energy needs and this has also further accelerated the use of fossil fuels. Further. There have been much more uh, use of the fossil fuels than the way uh, before. Uh, uh, people would want to own their own automobiles. People would want to use as much as electricity as they can, which was not the case a few years back. So if you also look in our lives, uh, probably 20 years back, we were not using as much energy as we are using today. Further, as compared to other countries, India is using a, just a, a very small portion of the energy on a per capita basis. This is something that we have discussed in the initial lectures. And if you look closely, we see that the CO2 in the atmosphere is primarily attributed to the human activities. Of course, there have been discussions that the CO2 emissions could be coming from other sources. But if one was to uh, go through the data, it, it shouldn't take much difficulty to correlate the increase in CO2 that has been happening in the past and the increase in the US activities, uh, uh, primarily the anthropogenic activities with, the, with respect to the increase in the energy production. Also, it also needs to be and it needs to be understood that CO2 is not the only GHG. Now, a greenhouse gas is something that would 
uh, basically come up with a greenhouse gas effect which means it is able to reflect a great portion of the radiation that is coming from the earth's surface whereas it, it doesn't cause any problem to the ins solar insulation that is entering the earth. So CO2 is one of the gas that is most uh, abundant but there are other gases primarily ex examples could be methane, N2O and se several of the chlorofluorocarbons uh, which also have very huge GHG potential. Further, it also needs to be understood that it's not only the CO2 levels that are rising, it has also these gases, the other gases which are much more potent than CO2 have also been rising in terms of the concentration in the atmosphere in the past uh, 50 or uh, past 50 years or so. Just for the sake of example, if we consider the uh, uh, increase in the level of methane, so in the last 60 years, uh, it has increased from like 715 ppb parts per billion to almost uh, more than double of around 1774 ppb in the year 2005. Something similar has been observed for the concentration of N2O uh, which again has been increasing its level from 270 parts per billion to 319 parts per billion and there have been several other GHGs uh, which were coming from the CFCs which were uh, causing again ozone depletion as well and again there were certain uh, gases that were having very less ozone depletion potential but again a very high GHG. So the refrigerants that were used in the past in air conditioning also have, were very potent GHGs. We can see uh, uh, and the basic difference between the potency of the different GHGs with the help uh, of this table that is in front of you. Uh, CO2 is often attributed as the base gas which has uh, is expected to have the GHG potential or the global warming potential of 1. If we consider a gas like methane, it is 20 times or more potent than uh, CO2. And if we go for other gases like N2O, the level could be 206. Other refrigerants which might not have very high ozone potential but it could be having a very great GHG potential in terms of maybe 10,000 times or 9,000 times to that of CO2. We will be discussing these things in a much more detail when we go to understanding LCA. But this is just to give you an understanding there are other gases which might be emitted in a very small amount but if you consider the relative potency that could be thousands of times much more than that of CO2. Further, if we consider how the total GHG gases have been varying in terms of CO2 equivalent, so if I equate, I equate all the gases in terms of the equal amount of CO2, we can see that in the past or till uh, very recent till the year 2019, almost 64 percent of the GHG emissions were directly attributed to the CO2 emissions and another 11 percent could be coming from the land use change. Then methane is another big greenhouse gas that is responsible for roughly 18 to 20 percent of uh, the total GHG gases. We also have the N2O which is coming around 5 percent and then we have the different CFCs which are also referred to as the F gases are uh, causing around 1 to 2 percent of the total uh, or forming the total of uh, uh, GHG emissions. So it needs to be understand that uh, a majority of the CO2 emissions or the GHG emissions are coming from direct emissions of CO2 and that is one of the reasons why everyone is talking about the carbon emissions and also CO2 is attributed uh, as a base gas and all the gases are, are converted or reflected in terms of CO2 equivalent. So how many kgs of CO2 equivalent that gas would is basically uh, is reflecting effectively. But again CO2 remains one of the major gas that needs to be understood, that needs to be tackled and the concentration of which needs to be brought down. Also uh, it has been found that this increase in CO2 has also been very nicely correlated to the increase in temperature of the world. So the, uh, the average temperature of the globe or of the earth has been steadily rising. So if we consider the temperature rise between uh, in the last 70 years or so, it has been roughly around, uh, uh, around 1 degree Celsius or so. And uh, people uh, would also be saying that of course these temperature uh, uh, rises have been happening in the past as well to some sense. But if we see the total rise, such kind of phenomena is not experienced or cannot be uh, related to the past. It is something that is very nicely correlated to the increase of the GHG emissions. Further, uh, there might be some studies who would say that if you look at the annual average, we see certain periods where the temperature has been rising as well. So if you see the graph on the right hand side, 
you see there have been a few blocks of year when there have been a stagnation in the global temperature or almost a certain depth. So if you see this, uh, the, uh, the area between 1940s to 1970s, the temp global temperature was almost stagnant or it was slightly reducing as well. So people might come up with uh, theories like this, like there have been periods of stagnation as well. But if we consider the temperature rise for the last 150 years or so, we can say that there has been a definite rise in the temperature. There have been uh, uh, like uh, there have been regions or uh, like there have been uh, time spans when it has been stagnating. But if you see the overall, it has been increasing, and this is something of a worrying phenomena. If we take a five-year average, which is a much better estimation or to understand the temperature of the planet Earth, it has been a continuously rising since the last 150 years or so. Further, this is a very complex phenomena that uh, it has been correlated with uh, uh, like weather phenomena like El Nino, La Nina, which are basically relate to the way like uh, the movement of oceans or the water bodies are considered and also like how the vegetation and the weather is occurring has a lot of effect on it. But if you see the overall effect, uh, it leads to one conclusion that the temperature has been significantly and steadily rising in the past. Let us also try to estimate the amount of CO2 that would have been emitted by the planet Earth uh, in the last one of uh, 50 years or so. So we have a, a nice uh, data about how the concentration of the CO2 in the atmosphere has been increasing from around 280 ppm that was there or, or in the industrial area or like, like the start of on the onset of the industrial area to the present around 400 plus ppm. So the CO2 concentration has been increasing at a steady rate and it used to be around 280 ppm and currently it's around uh, more than 400 uh, ppm and you can see that in the graph. Also the volume of the atmosphere can be approximately approximated by around 6 into 10 to power 18 meter cube and this is at 1 atm and uh, 298 kelvin. Uh, similar calculation we did in the first class of this course as well. If we were to estimate the mass of CO2 that would have been added since 1980s, uh, let us try to do this calculation. So let us move to the whiteboard for this. So let us consider the year 1880 and that is near when the industrial evolution started or near the start. Uh, so at that time uh, the CO2 concentration was almost 280 ppm which basically means 1 million or 10 to the power 6 meter cube of air would have 280 meter cube of CO2. So one part per every 1 million parts of air. So if there were 1 million parts of or meter cube of air, the uh, volume of CO2 in that air would be around 280 meter cube. We also understand that at STP, 1 kilomole is equal to 22.4 meter cube or 1 mole is equal to 22.4 liters. And this is something we all have studied in the past as well. So if there was 1 million meter cube of air, it meant there were 280 divided by 22.4 kilomoles of CO2 that were present. And if you do this calculation, this would be roughly 12.5 kilomoles of CO2. We know the molecular weight of CO2 which is 44, multiply with that and this would come around to be around 550 kgs of CO2 per 1 million meter cube of air. We also know that the uh, entire atmosphere can be approximated as 6 into 10 to the power 18 meter cube. And so if I talk about the entire atmosphere, I just multiply that factor and this would come around to be roughly 3.3 
into 10 to power 50 kgs of CO2. So this was the amount of CO2 that was there at the onset of the industrial revolution. Now fast forward it to the recent history in the year 2018. We know the concentration is almost 408 ppm. If we consider the data today it might be slightly more than that. So we, we, we know that this is equivalent to like 1 million meter cube, cube of air is equivalent to 408 meter cube of CO2. Uh, so if I see that I can divide this again by the factor of 22.4 to give me kilomoles of CO2. This would roughly come around to be 18.2 and further I can multiply with the molecular weight of CO2 and this would come around to be 801 kgs of CO2 and this is for 1 million meter cube of atmosphere and if I was to talk about the entire atmosphere I, do, I multiply that with the uh, volume of the atmosphere and this value would come around to be roughly 4.81 into 10 to power 15 kgs of CO2. So there is no doubt that the absolute amount of CO2 in terms of kgs has been increasing. So earlier when it was around 3.3 10 to power 5 kgs and now it is 4.81 10 to power 5, 15 kgs of CO2. I can take the difference of the two and this would come around to be roughly 1.5 into 10 to power 15 kgs of CO2 or I can also say roughly around 1500 billion tons of CO2 or I can also say 1.5 trillion tons of CO2. So this is the tons of CO2 that has been emitted by the anthropogenic activities that has been extra since uh, this onset of industrial evolution. If we go back to the slides and we try to see the cumulative CO2 emissions since the past, we see that like uh, the figure is quite uh, close to what has been in reality as well. So it's around 1.6 trillion tons of CO2 that has been emitted on a, uh, on a, a cumulative level and, and different countries have their own emission profiles. Some have been emitting less, some have been emitting more. But uh, overall there has been a lot of emissions of this particular gas that has been going into the atmosphere and this very well correlates with the increase in the in uh, fuel uses in terms of fossil fuels, coal, oil and natural gas in the industries as well as the industry uh, energy production industries. So we understand that these kinds of industries uh, have been a major source of CO2 and this has also been correlated with the increase on CO2 and this CO2 again correlates very nicely with the temperature rise as well as uh, the phenomena of global warming or the climate change which is responsible for harsh weather events. So with this uh, or in this class we have tried to get some basic understanding of the concept of uh, global climate change. In the future classes we are going to uh, understand this concept even in more depth and we are going to discuss what are the ways in which we can mitigate or what could be the key methodologies for mitigating this problem of global, global climate change. With this we end today's class. Thank you.